This is HSC option 3 sports medicine. The key idea, what role do preventative actions play in enhancing the well-being of the athlete? And the syllabus point we're looking at here is environmental considerations. And it's looking at such uh, aspects as temperature regulation. Um, that's how the body's thermoregulation system works. Uh, climatic conditions focusing on temperature, humidity, wind and rain, etc. What the guidelines should be for the correct fluid intake to combat dehydration. And finally, acclimatization. And they're the two right-hand side syllabus student learn tos, which I'll address in a moment. There are factors in the environment, such as the hot and cold weather, wind and humidity that can seriously impact the athlete's performance, and also in some instances lead to illnesses such as heat stroke and hypothermia. Many of these environmental considerations can be prevented if proper precautions are taken, such as wearing the correct clothing to counter the hot and cold, and having the correct fluid intake to avoid dehydration, which in turn can lead to heat stroke. The student learn to requires you to evaluate, that's make a judgment on the strategies that could be used to, su to support the body's internal temperature control system or sometimes known as thermoregulation. The second point requires you to analyse or look into the implications of how different climatic conditions affect safe participation in sport. The first dash point is temperature regulation. The body's temperature regulation system is known as thermoregulation. It's the manner in which the body is able to maintain a constant internal temperature of approximately 37 degrees, give or take one degree either side, despite changes in external temperatures. The body can either gain or lose heat from the following means. The first of these processes is called convection. Convection is the process of losing heat through the movement of air or water across the skin. Runners in cold conditions find it difficult to warm up if they have skin exposed as the wind passing over the body will cool the body. Wearing skins, tights, gloves and a hat will help prevent heat loss by convection. Radiation describes the gain of heat or loss of heat to the surrounding atmosphere. The body will lose heat when the atmosphere is cooler than the body or the body will increase in temperature when the atmosphere is warmer than the body. For example, on the court during the Australian Open tennis, temperatures regularly are in the high 30s and beyond. Conduction is when the body loses or gains heat with direct contact with another object. Swimming in cold water and the body will then lose heat. To combat this, triathletes and surfers will wear wetsuits. Playing tennis on a hot court and the body will gain heat from the, con from the contact of the shoes on the playing surface. Evaporation is about when exercise increases your body temperature. When your hypothalamus, an area of your brain that acts as a thermostat, senses a raise in body temperature, it takes action to, prevent, to protect your body. The hypothalamus directs more of your blood flow to the skin and signals the body to start sweating. Sweating is the primary means of cooling the body in warm environments. If the sweat drips off or is wiped off with a towel, there will be less of a benefit of this cooling system. The next dash point is climatic conditions, and it's important for this dash point to make the link to the next two dash points in the syllabus. When talking about hot and humid temperatures, you make the link to the dash point fluid intake. And when discussing temperature and altitude, you can make the link to acclimatization. So let's get into climatic conditions. In discussing these syllabus points, sorry, in discussing these syllabus examples under climatic conditions, it is more effective to combine some of them together. For example, high temperatures and high humidity. The body sweats as a cooling mechanism in hot temperatures, and during high humidity, the sweat does not evaporate as quickly. This means that the body does not cool as effectively as it would in low humidity. Exercising in hot and humid conditions means the body's core temperature is likely to rise and hypothermia can result. There are two heat related illnesses associated with hypothermia. They are heat stress and heat stroke. Heat stroke is the more serious and can be life threatening. Symptoms of heat stress include cramping, dizziness, nausea and fatigue. When temperatures are above 30 degrees and about above, sorry, and above 50% in humidity, the following preventative measures should include 
exercise in the early morning or late afternoon wherever possible and if this is not possible exercise should actually be uh, cancelled for the day wear light colored clothing as it reflects the heat better than darker colored clothing does exercise in the shade where possible wear wear a hat and sorry wear a broad brim hat and sunglasses um, stop the activity for regular water breaks that means stay hydrated and if possible during breaks in play use fans and ice vests where appropriate We'll stay with temperature and have a look at the combination of cold, wind and rain. Now because of Australia's climate this is generally not such a big issue. Temperatures have to get below 4 degrees before hypothermia can be of concern. However higher temperatures and 4 degrees combined with wind and rain can create significant wind chill where hypothermia could become an issue. Preventative measures to counter this include um, wearing of waterproof clothing, uh, wearing wind jackets and polar fleeces and this is particularly applicable to outdoor sports perhaps where a runner might be running in the winter months. Water sports during winter months are sports that are most at risk. Sports that can be affected include surf life saving, uh, water skiing, triathlons, the swim leg and also surfing. If a good quality wetsuit is worn it should prevent any problems of potential hypothermia however the length of time spent in the water should be restricted and you should never be in the water alone. Often problems can be encountered when the individual leaves the water and is exposed to the outside elements. It's important for the person to remove wet clothing and put on a warm and put on warm clothing immediately. Um, signs and symptoms of hypothermia include constant shivering, which is actually the body's defense mechanism against the cold, um, tiredness, low energy, cold or pale skin. The next dash point is guidelines for fluid intake. Regular intake of fluids is essential for sporting performance. The longer and more intense the exercise, the more important it is to drink the right kind and the right amount of fluid. Drinking regularly before and during exercise can help prevent dehydration and potentially many heat related illnesses. Now how much should athletes drink during exercise? Well firstly fluid losses are affected by uh, genetics. Some people just sweat more than other people. Um, the fitness levels of the athlete. Generally speaking fitter people sweat more than non-fit people. The actual environment so depending on how hot or humid the conditions are and also the intensity of the exercise. But as a general guide athletes should consume 200 to 300 mils 10 minutes before exercising and then a further 200 to 300 mils for every 15 to 20 minutes during the actual exercise. So an example of that could be in a, a marathon or a fun run at the drink stations it would probably occur about every 15 to 20 minutes. Now sports drinks are recommended once exercise is longer than 40 to 60 minutes. In endurance events um, substantial weight loss can occur from fluid loss. This needs to be replaced and the recommendations for this is to consume 1.5 litres per 1 kilogram of body loss. So what happens there is um, the athlete needs to be aware of their weight pre-exercise and then weigh themselves after exercise. So if they were to lose two kilos, which would be common in say a marathon for example, they would need to be consuming three litres to replace that fluid loss. Although rare, athletes can drink too much water and suffer from um, an illness called hyponatremia, which means water intoxication. Drinking excessive amounts of water can cause a low concentration of sodium in the blood, which is a serious medical emergency. The next and final dash point is acclimatization. For a team preparing to play or compete in hot and cold conditions, they should have a time of acclimatization in the conditions they are going to encounter. This is particularly important if the player or team is coming from a different weather season. For example, before the Socceroos competed at the Brazil World Cup in 2014, they were going to be in hot conditions and many of the players were coming from a cold environment. The Socceroos had a two week training camp in Brazil to help their body to become accustomed to the hot and humid conditions. This should have assisted the players performance in terms of stopping them from deteriorating in the closing minutes of the match or suffering from many heat illnesses. The guidelines are 60 minutes 
of exercise each day for up to 10 days before the start of the competition. Acclimatization is also important at high altitude. Competing at high altitude is difficult because the air is thinner, which means getting oxygen to the muscles becomes more difficult. The wallabies when playing in some cities in South Africa will arrive in that city earlier than they normally would. A period of acclimatization will help the body adapt to the changing conditions. This brings an end to this particular dot point. Um, I hope you found it helpful as always. The advice is if you need further information see your textbook or consult your teacher.